Good morning, church. You guys could have been anywhere in beautiful Southwest Florida, and you guys chose to come to church this morning, and that just warms my heart. Thanks for being here today. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Chris Brooks. I've uh, been coming here to Fellowship Church uh, almost a decade uh, now. God has completely turned my life around um, coming here and serving on the worship team and just being loved on by a church like you guys. I, I don't deserve it, but God thinks I do, so I got it. <laughs> um, I just had a, you know, wanted to talk this morning a little bit about discipleship. Um, and the Great Commission, what that's looked like in my life, and what that should look like in your life according to what the Bible says, and um, just kind of dig in and encourage you guys today. Um, again, appreciate you guys being here. I love y'all. All right, so all four Gospels include some form of this Great Commission. So, you know, Jesus came back, he died, he resurrected, so in that period of time from the resurrection, all four Gospels, including Acts, kind of go over, uh, you know, the account of that Great Commission where Jesus tells us to go forth and, and preach the Gospel to all the world. Um, so he had just resurrected. He had, he had started to appear, you know, the, the, to, the two Marys went to check on the tomb and, and found that it was empty. He appeared to a few of the disciples on the Emmaus Road, um, and nobody was quite believing what they were hearing, right? They were going back, Jesus is alive, the tomb is empty, and, and even the 11 that walked with him for three years were like, uh, really? Are you, are you sure that's what you saw? Are you sure that's what you heard? Because that doesn't sound right. So they were really still in that disbelief uh, period. So in, in Mark, he had just came in to the room with the 11 and said, pretty much, you hard-headed men, why have you been so unfaithful? Why are you doubting that I'm alive, that I rose from the dead? Didn't I tell you this was going to happen? So he said, and then he, that's when he started. He gives them the commission right after that. He says, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Proclaim the good news that I have come, I have risen for the remission of sin, and people can be set free. Go to all creation and spread that good news of the gospel. Now, Matthew, I like Matthew because Matthew goes into really a lot more detail with a lot of his, his accounts. So in Matthew, Jesus speaking, he comes into the room and says to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, that's some encouragement right there, letting them know, I'm not going to leave you guys. I'm still here. I might not be physically here with you, but I am with you through the end of the age. So this mission that I've just put you on, this commission that I've just commanded you to do, I'm going to be with you so you can accomplish that. So tell me that's not encouragement. So I'm reading through that, that verse, and I look, and I say, okay, God, go and make disciples. So what does that mean? What does that look like? How do I, how do, I do that? What's well, a disciple? So I take a cue from my pastor. I pull out the old Webster's Dictionary. And Webster says it's a learner, a scholar, one who receives or professes to receive instruction from another, just like the disciples of Plato. Or the more Christian definition that Webster's gives is a follower adherent to the doctrines of another. Hence, the people that walked with Jesus were called his disciples. And all us who believe in Jesus are called his disciples. We're called to follow him. We're students of his ways, of his precepts. Learn and receive his doctrines and precepts. So back that up to, to Matthew again. All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. This is Jesus speaking. This isn't one of the disciples that have been given all power on heaven and earth. This is Jesus speaking. He told them to go and make disciples of him, his precepts, of his ways. That doesn't mean I've been called to make disciples of Chris. I've been called to make disciples of Christ. You haven't been called to make disciples of Gary. 
been called to make disciples of Christ, his precepts. So be cautious if you have this personal revelation that you've written in the back of your Bible. Don't go preaching that gospel to people. His ways, his words, period. Just want to be, I just want to be clear in that. We're not to make disciples of ourselves. Paul didn't make disciples of Paul. We're to make disciples and not converts. So sharing the gospel with somebody, leading them to faith in Christ, and then just, and then just leaving them, giving somebody this bundle of hope, this good news, and then just, I hope you do well with it. No, you're a new creation in Christ now. You're to nurture and teach and walk with somebody to make them a disciple. How do you have a student in your classroom as a teacher that you haven't poured any time into? You're just going to give them the subject matter and hope that they pass the test? That's not going to work. Not in any aspect of life, especially not in a spiritual, in a spiritual realm. Let's also not get confused with this go into all the world portion. Jesus said to start in Jerusalem. He was, he was kind of alluding to the prophecy in Daniel. The Son of Man has come, prophecy fulfilled. It's time for the end gathering of the nations, prophecy fulfilled. So guys, go out there and get them, is what he was saying. As you go, make disciples. Not pack up everything you have, move to Burma, move to India so you can, so you can save. Not saying that in your goings that you're not going to be traveling. Because he knew that some were meant to travel and were going to spread the gospel far. But let's not forget to start right here in our hometown. Our Jerusalem is right here, Inglewood, Northport, Port Charlotte, Punta Gorda. There's lost people here. We don't have to go overseas to find lost people to preach the gospel to. So just like Paul and Timothy, Paul walked with Timothy. He didn't just give Timothy instructions and then just send him out on his own. He walked with him daily. He poured into that man's life. He, he raised him up to be a speaker of truth with the truth that God had given Paul. We all need to have that Paul relationship in our life. We need that Paul that's speaking truth, that's breathing life into us, that we can go to in times of struggle, in times we're confused. We read something in the Bible that we don't understand. It's really important that we have that older sage of a person that we can go to and, and get those answers from. We also need, as we become more mature as a Christian, we need a Timothy. So we need someone leading and teaching us as well as someone that we're leading and teaching. God didn't give you this truth for you to just hold on to it and then just not give it away. It's a gift. So find somebody in your life that you can just pour into, that you can breathe that life into, that you can speak that truth to. I know I wouldn't be the man I am today without people who loved me enough to invest their time in sharpening me. I've got men in this crowd right now that I'm involved with in different men's ministries. If you're a marked man for Christ or, or if you do Fight Club with me, can y'all just throw your hand up real quick? A lot of these men don't even go to this church. They're here today to support me and their brother Kyle as he gave his testimony. Also, God bless you guys. You've been here since first service. Like, y'all chose to be in church all day today. That's, that's some support right there. Absolutely. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Think about that for a minute. Iron sharpening iron. Does that sound like just washing a plate clean and putting it away? It's not going to be easy, and it's not always going to feel good sharpening somebody or being sharpened. Take one piece of iron and rub it against that other piece of iron. It takes friction and grinding and scraping those layers off until you're sharp. That's not going to be comfortable or easy for either piece of iron in that situation, in that relationship. 
But it's what we've been called to do. We've been called to love one another enough that we can talk to somebody out of tough love. Hey, brother, hey, sister, you're a little out of line here. This is where I see that you could use some work. I need that in my life. If any of you see that I'm out of line, I expect you to come to me and say, hey, brother, you need a little sharpening in this area. I need that. And like I said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some tough love. But make sure it's love first. Don't just come to a lost sinner and say, I see your sin. You're terrible. Look at the life you live in. That's not going to bring somebody to Christ. How about develop a relationship with them first? How about get to know them? How about get to know their struggles and what led them to that portion in their life where they're living in that sin first before we judge them? Then once they trust you and they realize that you really do love them, then maybe point out some of their sin nature and walk them through that. That's what I've had in my life. God has blessed me with this family up here on stage. Any of, these, any of these band members I can come to in a crisis, in a situation where I don't know what to do, and find an answer. I have support. I've got, I've got my men and women that have my back that I can call at any point. And they'll, they'll, they'll breathe that life into me. They'll tell me if I'm in my head or if I'm in my heart about a certain subject. And that means a lot. So we've been called to make disciples. Jesus also told us to be fishers of men. But what kind of fishermen did he call us to be? With a lure or with a net? With something that we hope is attractive enough to the lost world that might lure them into church? Come down to church on Sunday and get your blessing. Put your money in the, in the plate and we'll double it. Come down and get your healing at church. Not that God doesn't heal, but you don't have to come down to a show. We don't have to put on a show and make the gospel attractive to the lost world. God doesn't need you to dress up his word. It cuts to the marrow of the bone. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Speak his truth, and that's good enough. You don't need fluff. He doesn't need you to make something attractive in order to get the lost into church. We cast a net of truth. We've been called to be net fishermen. Not hang a shiny lure out there that looks good to somebody and hope we catch them and get them into church. Because that's not going to stick. We need our nets to be sticky. And we can keep them fish in the nets. We speak and live out the truth from the word of God. That's our net we cast into a sea of unbelievers. And that power, the Holy Spirit, will work inside of them through that truth the words of the word of God. And they won't be able to help it but come to church. You don't have to put something shiny out there to lure them in that looks good to the world. That's not what we've been called to do. Cast that net of truth. Then do the next step. Pull the rope. Use your other hand, pull the other rope, pull them in. That part's not going to be easy. So what do you do? Who are you? I'm a low-voltage electrician. I've been called as I go, wiring jobs, doing security alarm installs to make disciples. Are you a real estate agent? As you go selling houses, make disciples. Are you, are you a home builder as you build houses, make disciples? Whatever that is, are you a, a neighbor, a mother, a teacher, a, a friend? Anybody in your sphere of influence, any non-believers you come in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis is a potential candidate for a disciple. They're right in front of our face. So don't get discouraged if you're not overseas preaching the gospel to somebody in India, or if you're not down in South America saving some hungry little child, not that that's not needed, but there's loss right in front of your face every day as you go. Make disciples of him. So let's get our nets ready. Let's keep them in good condition so we might fulfill that great commission. 
Now, there's three things we're going to need in order to fulfill that commission that he's called us to do. Otherwise, it's, otherwise it's not going to work. The first one is the Holy Spirit. Only through the work of the Spirit is any of this possible. No lives changed. No hearts are changed. Nothing in here is different without the Holy Spirit. So make sure he's in it. He needs to be in it, around it, and through it. The whole process. Number two, love. Without love, I'm nothing. Without love, I gain nothing. It profits me nothing to go on this commission without love in my heart. You're never going to catch any fish if you hate fish. And it works with people too. You know, you get this disdain for a certain sin that people are committing, a certain lifestyle that people are living in, and they see that. They see that you already don't like them for their sin. You got to love people right where they are. Number three, truth. No fluff, no extra, no I feel like, here's my personal revelation on the, on the matter, truth. Sharing the gospel just as it is without any fluff. That Christ died to pay the price for our sin. <laughs> God accepted that payment on our behalf. How good is that? How good is that? We have done nothing but wrong our Father. And He doesn't see any of that. Once we put our faith in Christ, the blood that He shed on that cross for us covers every sin that we've ever committed. And God doesn't even see it anymore. The price is paid. That's the gospel, guys. That's the good news he wants us to go and tell the world. That's what's going to get lost people into church. The spirit, love, and truth. And I think that'll do. So if anybody here this morning doesn't know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, I'd like, to, I'd like to offer you guys that opportunity before we do close out today. I'm going to talk about that Lord and Savior. You know, that's a, it's kind of a, it's become a churchy phrase, I guess. My Lord and Savior. Everybody likes the Savior part. Have you really made him your Lord? Is he really lording over your life? Have, have you given up your own predispositions and just let him rule and let him reign in every aspect of your life? Or are you just really glad you're not going to hell and you're thanking him for your savior part? We've been called to live for him, guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a good day. God, we thank you for all good things. Your love, your mercy, your grace on us. God, we thank you that you sent a way that we could spend eternity with you. Since creation, you've drawn us to you. You've wanted that relationship, Lord. God, we thank you that you pursue us. God, we love you because you love us. And overall, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Because without him, what's the point of any of this, Lord? And with heads bowed, if you don't know that you know confidently that if you died today, that you'd be spending eternity with your Lord in heaven, if you're not sure, 
I'd like to offer you that opportunity today. God's word said, we've all fallen short of his glory. The wages of sin is death. And after that death, our punishment is hell. But if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart, that's right here in the center, that he died for us, that he rose again, and that he's coming back for us one day. If you believe in that, you shall be saved. That's it. Just confess and believe in your heart. So if you don't know for sure, I'd like to lead you in a prayer this morning. So Heavenly Father, God, I know I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you, Lord. Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me because I know only you can. And God, I don't understand how all this is going to work. Maybe I don't quite get what born again is going to look like or what that means. But right now, this morning, Lord, I'm putting my faith and my trust in you, Jesus. I believe that you died for me. Jesus, I believe that you conquered death and hell and the grave for me and you rose again and Jesus I believe that you love me and God the best way that I know how this morning I put my faith in you come into my heart Lord and live in me Amen. Guys, if you said that prayer this morning, I just want to welcome you to the family. You're now an adopted son or daughter, a co-heir to the kingdom of heaven. We will reign with Christ forever. If you need somebody to talk to, we've got a lot. A lot of people here who can pray with you, who can walk with you, and love on you. Thank you, guys. God bless.